What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> what's up? <laughs> this weekend, my man! Screamo time, everybody. Welcome to Twim. I'm Jeff Openshaw, your founder and host, and I've just blown out my voice for the remainder of this episode, so Devin's going to, you know, shoulder the <laughs> talking portion, and I'm just going to say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it's great to have all of you here this week. Very excited. Lots of interesting news this week. BYU's in some uh, hot water-ish over Title IX issues and LGBTQ students. We've got some Pacific Island nations uh, going into lockdown. A bizarre documentary alleging that uh, some of Joseph Smith's closest associates actually murdered him because fighting and a um, uh, good handful of other things, COVID, COVID issues, a uh, cool documentary on Finland missionaries, some news out of Ukraine, cool stuff for the giving machines and some other good, good content. So we look forward to getting into it this week. It's going to be awesome. But like I, I implied there, just want to welcome Devin Thorpe back to the show. What's going on, sir? Hey, it's great to be back with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, since the last time I was on, we moved to Florida and so I'm enjoying the winter without snow. Uh, Floridians this morning went into uh, a bit of a panic because there was frost on the ground in some parts oh. of Florida. Oh, my Not God. Not in my neighborhood. That thankfully. kills the orange crops, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. I guess it's it's bad for the crops if it gets real cold. Uh, I think it only got down to like 31 or 32 degrees. I don't but think that's, that, that's cold, though, for... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's unusual. For Jackson. Not unheard of yeah. for Florida. How how do you, now? I know you kind of were just. I don't say you threw. It's like you threw a dart at a map, but I know you didn't have any pre-existing ties really to the Jacksonville area. Just yeah. kind of zeroed in on it. Made sense. So how how do you find the yeah. Jacksonville, Florida? Now that you've been, are starting to spend some time there and make it your home. The the best part of Jacksonville for us, quite honestly, is uh, the church, and you know the I. I I am among those who uh, can find fault in some of the things that uh, the church and church members do around race, but the church does that better than I sometimes want to give it credit. You know, the the church is the most genuinely interracial place we go. Uh, And I just love that, right? I mean, it is a really diverse population. We've got Chinese speakers and we've got Spanish speakers and we've got uh, African Americans in leadership. I mean, it's just really a groovy ward to be Gro- a part of, and we're groovy we're is the adjective of choice, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> groovy is. And of course, that's the, how you measure uh, the truthfulness of uh, a ward is is how its groovy grooviness. It is. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, so. everyone knows that. Yeah, you know, I saw course. a similar thing in. Um, I remember when I went to church in Atlanta. I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but yeah, I went to church. I was in Atlanta for some stuff. Went to church just south of downtown. Uh, a lot of cool pluralism within the ward there. It was a lot of fun, like kind of what you mentioned, like you had, you had, you had a multiracial bishopric. The ward was probably evenly split between black and white 50-50 or so. And what I loved about that is it just like you saw so much harmony in the gospel itself without concern for other things or classic majoritarian politics and what have you. And it was cool. There was just great vibes there. I mean, I only, you know, stopped yeah. in basically just for sacked remaining, but it was a terrific word. Everyone was super friendly. Big shout out to all yeah. you fine folks, whatever word that was. I <laughs> yeah. my time there. I wonder how long it'll take them to figure out that Devin does twim. I don't know if anyone in my old ward ever figured out I was doing twim. So uh, I could live in Florida for 20 years, maybe <laughs> never, no one would ever figure it out. They'll never know. Uh, know. For a bit of trivia for our listeners, Jacksonville, everyone, is actually the biggest city in Florida. People don't think, you know, probably think in Miami or Tampa, but because Jacksonville consolidated the entire county around it back in like the 90s, it is both the largest city by population and the largest by geographical area in the entire state. It's the largest geographical city in the country. Yeah, it's humongous. And um, it's about the same size as Salt Lake County. By comparison, for some that are more familiar with Salt Lake County, okay, and of course, Salt Lake County has uh, what two dozen municipalities, uh, yeah, probably, and, around that, yeah. and and Jacksonville has one municipality, but I actually think there are multiple counties that uh, are included in in Jacksonville. Uh, it's, in, it's in the whole metro area, yeah, I mean, it's bigger. Yeah. But but with that said, because Jacksonville has subsumed the entire county. 
it might be the biggest single city, but as a metropolitan area, it pales compared to Miami, right. Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, and all that, which have yeah. a lot more sprawl. Well, I like talking authoritatively about a place I've never been. So thank you for humoring me <laughs> about that. You're kind of in the South. You're in North Florida, but you're, I'm sure culture there's yeah. a little more Southern. than Yeah. Uh, the farther uh, North you go, the farther South you get in Florida. So yeah, we're right up there out near the Georgia border in the, in the heart of Dixie. So. And now there's only one Dixie after what be what, what's right. done down no there in Southern Dixie Utah. In Utah. Yeah. No more. Cool, man. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself out there. Yeah, we dream. are. We are for sure. Live in but the I'm dream. excited to be here talking about TWIM. Yes, but specifically about TWIM. Not about actual Latter-day Saint news, but <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about the podcast. What it okay. means to you, the emotions yes. you have around it. Um, so like we said, a lot has gone down this week. Uh, all, all sorts of interesting things. And um, goodness, I don't even know where to start. I'm actually going to start off with one of our favorite joint countries. Uh, my friend Kitabits. We once did an article called "How to Pronounce Kitabits," which is, reads yeah. like Kiribati if you've seen it. Um, I remember they did a Survivor there, I think, one year, and I swear, even on CBS, they said like Survivor Kiribati because nobody knew better back then. Yeah. So Kitabits was one of the world's last COVID-free places. Remember, it's a it's a series of atolls and whatnot in the Pacific. Uh, we're getting a temple there. It was also one of our oft-predicted temples in Tarawa, the capital. Pretty densely LDS of a country. But now uh, Kitabits is under lockdown. Of course, you might be wondering the Latter-day Saint angle here. Like, that's unfortunate. This country has held it off for two years and change now. But now they're under lockdown, specifically because a flight landed from Fiji last week about a week ago was the first plane to arrive since the country reopened its borders okay so the reason they haven't had anything is this is a country that is also reliant on tourism and everything but they have just not let outsiders in all 54 passengers were isolated at a facility and about two-thirds of them wound up testing positive for covid and now because of this they are dealing with all the fallout from that trying to isolate the people keep the disease from getting out of the lockdown area of the airport. But now the country is in lockdown uh, to try to handle it. The curious thing, though, is about 90 percent. Um, sorry, this is the Kiribati population, but they did they did say that uh, a good chunk. Basically, I think everyone on the flight was already vaxxed, double vaxxed. Everyone was quarantined two weeks in advance and everyone tested negative three times at several intervals throughout the days. And the flight uh, way to bury the lead, Jeff. The flight was chartered by the church. So we're assuming the passengers on said plane chartered by the church were church reps of some kind, perhaps people that are set apart to preach the gospel, um, various things of that ilk. Yeah, uh, We've seen, we've looked a lot, we've dug around a little bit online to try to find more context for this, what it could mean. I haven't found anything definitive because uh, Kitabits is not part of the Fiji mission. Those are separate missions, but there were some who argued that these were actual nationals from Kitabits who were finally allowed to return to the country, which makes a lot of sense. It was the first flight back in. You have missionaries who might've been serving in Fiji or somewhere else in, you know, in, in Melanesia or whatever else finally allowed to go back home. And we saw this, you know, during a lot of the days of COVID people who couldn't return to their home countries, they were stranded out there. So the church seems to have, if that, if that is the case, whatever, maybe the church seems to have been following all the appropriate processes, but uh, Omicron does what Omicron does. Right. And uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy how uh, pervasive uh, Omicron has become. Right. I mean, it's just absolutely nuts reaching beyond, you know, I, I can't count the number of friends anymore uh, who've been, you know, vaxxed and boosted and got Omicron. Uh, no. it, yeah, I just, I keep tripping all over them. Uh, the good news is I think uh, we've peaked and uh, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that what will emerge from this is that this will serve as the final wave of, you know, vaccination in a, in essence, as as everyone kind of has either been vaccinated or got sick or both, and uh, well, that hope. should leave us in a in a, maybe a mode where we can go back to more normal after this. So let's hope that in sixty days we're done. 
Maybe I read some other, of course, and this, this is the thing, of course, with all of COVID, everyone's like, but I read this, but I read this, yeah. right? And the, part of that's right. science, everyone. Part of it's because we keep learning and evolving and applying what we learn. That is the nature right. of science. Yeah. I think it's kind of cracked me up that people expected the CDC to have all the answers unflailingly and never change course ago. back right. in March, 2020. Like, no, like this is the thing that we've had to figure out and we're still figuring it out. But I, I saw some research that wondered whether it would, whether the opposite would happen and Omicron would make us like weaker for the next variant that might come through and then we'll have bigger problems unless we get vaxxed. I don't know. And I don't even know yeah. if, if you get the Omicron variant, will it still provide you with the same level of antibodies as you might've gotten with a, with a, right. a rougher case if you had Delta or something else? Yeah, but, um, that's a good point. Uh, but we don't, we don't know yeah. everything yet. Yeah. And that's all we can do is hope. And, you know, folks, once again, we just want to, just want to remind you here just to encourage this, you know, vaccinations are a good thing. The church is behind them. Unless you think we're making this up, church is behind them. Very clearly behind right. the, va- behind them. Pro vaccine, pro us getting vaccine, pro you getting a vaccine. In as much as your health situation allows for it, okay. I mean, yeah. so you know the church and has gone out of its place. Very few saying, people for whom health situations don't allow it, right? It's, yeah, and, and if they yeah. do, fine. And I get there's concerns about your kids and things. Okay, you know, whatever. But uh, you know, get that vaccine. Yeah. Take it seriously, people. Even if yeah. yes, you can get Omicron even with the vaccine, but you're still better off with the vaccine. Oh yeah. Without. Full. End, I think end that's of one of the that's one of the key Omicron mysteries. Right is uh, a lot of the cases are milder, but a lot of the people who are getting Omicron uh, were vaccinated. Yeah. So it's not altogether clear whether it typically would result in uh, a less uh, severe illness, or if it's just that it's a less severe illness if you've been vaccinated. Because you're vaccinated. Uh, well, we do know a lot of the people, a lot of the hospitalizations are still com- happening amongst the unvaccinated, which yeah, is a, yeah. an absolute shame. But that's true. The, some, there are some things that are mysteries and we'll figure yeah. them out. Um, just so you know, everybody, as another quick COVID bit of news, then we're not, we don't have too much of it this week. We did kind of mention last week, you know, it seemed like we were kind of, it seemed like things were getting real again. Jared and I were talking about that. Like all of a sudden you were hearing about second hour meetings being canceled. I just got an email tonight from the area presidency that, that didn't, it didn't dictate what you should do because that's all of North America, Northeast. But saying like, please remember where they actually, this is interesting, the language they said, not just to wear a mask, they said wear an effective mask, which was a good reminder, wear effective masks, Yeah. but hold sacrament meetings at regularly scheduled times, but consider offering virtual meetings again if you can. Try to socially distance as much as possible. Uh, if you can't socially distance in a classroom, consider doing your son, your um, second hour meetings virtually. Uh, I appreciate these reminders, right? And it's, But it does. Yeah. it's easy to feel like we're backsliding after all the progress we've made to try to kind of get normal. Again, and one area where this has also been affected a little bit is temples. Jared mentioned last week on the pod that the Idaho Falls Temple had reduced capacity. They said they can only fill endowment sessions to about 30% of capacity. Um, And that, of course, made it harder to get in. The church is tracking that, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the complications therein, they're just sending, they sent a quick statement out on Friday last week, reminding people that temple capacity is still limited and it can be potentially getting more limited in some areas. And so if that's the case, don't just assume you can quickly make a temple appointment, whether to go do whatever work you are looking to do, plan it out as best as you can and schedule it far enough in advance, because this is a straight up classic, just scarcity issue, right? So demand is higher than supply in terms of temple availability. So just, so this is just a good warning from the church. Just consider that if you're planning on going to the temple, do not assume you can just say, let's go to the temple this weekend and that it might be available to you. Like, so take your Jeff, time, do you, make a plan. Do you think the church will keep scheduling temples after COVID? Will this become the new way we do it because the church likes it so much? Or do you think it bugs the crap out of the <laughs> temple administrations and they want this to go away more than we do? I don't know. I mean, because it depends on the temple. There are a number of temples where you've, you've had to have a reservation for years and a lot of smaller oh. ones, right? That's, oh, okay. I mean, I, I guess... Folks in in Utah and some more heavily LDS areas might not have dealt with that as often. You're, you're used to capacity, you're used to just knowing what time sessions are and showing up to do them. I we've had that in DC for a long time, but back home in Newport Beach, for example, is a smaller temple. No, if you want to go, you call in advance, you make sure they had room, you put your name on the list, and you go. You don't just show up for a session. And all the Hinkley era mini temples function that way as well. So it could be a time to sort of permanently shift over to that. Maybe you know, I don't know. Maybe yeah. that's a good good question. 
it makes yeah, it I'm, easier to manage capacity and and all that. Oh yeah, it would be, but it, it is it, but it is more it's more administrative it, work though, right? It should eliminate getting to the temple and discovering your session is overbooked, or, you know, overcrowded, and you yeah. can't get in, and you've got to wait an extra hour to to go. And in these, like in the Salt Lake Temple, where traditionally you'd, there's only a session every hour. Um, oh, only the, a session the, every hour. Is that all? Yeah. You poor people. <laughs> <laughs> oh no oh no yeah well of course that's compared to some of the other utah temples where you can go in a session every 20 minutes so yeah well and it depends and that that goes back to part of the reasons for the renovation of the salt lake temple we are we are losing some of its pioneer heritage and i'm sad live sessions will be gone but the idea is to increase the capacity of that iconic building because it's it lags or it's lagged behind other Utah yeah. temples and in, in what it can offer in terms of capacity because of that. Yeah. I mean, you go to Jordan River where you've got six endowment rooms surrounding a celestial room. Those are the ones that could just crank them out. Just boom, boom, boom. Yeah. I mock it, well, but DC, DC can do sessions frequently like that as well. They just have, because we have a similar layout. Yeah. DC is still my favorite temple. Uh, Come up yeah. for the open house, buddy. End of April. I, I, I got to do that. I really should. I really should. I got to, I got to, yeah. I love that temple. What a great temple. Wow, wow, wow. Um, wow, wow. So uh, Tonga, uh, what a tragedy in, in Tonga. And I think we're just beginning to figure it out uh, yeah. after this huge volcano and the uh, ensuing, uh, uh, I want to say tidal wave. What is it? It's a tsunami, tsunami. right? Tsunami that I, uh, the word that was escaping me. But yeah, hor- uh, what a tragedy. Uh, and uh, you reminded me that it's the most LDS country in the world uh, in terms of percentage of Mormons. Uh, yeah. And I've got some dear friends from that uh, community, and uh, it is just uh, terribly tragic. So what's happened? Tell me more. So, so uh, you know, the, the church is helping out uh, and helping to organize some of the relief efforts. Um, what else is going on? That's the main thing. I think the church is, I, I'm assuming the church will be involved there regardless, but I guess it's extra symbolic when such a large yeah. percentage of the country is, is among the, I, I was going to say among the faithful. We don't know if they're among the faithful, but they are among the records of the church. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're that's right. They're faithful. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I, there are 174 units in, in Tonga. Which so. is a lot for its population. I mean, Tonga's yeah. whole, I mean, holy cow. I mean, yeah. Tonga's population. Tonga's population is one hundred and five thousand people. Oh wow! And you said one hundred and how many units? One hundred and seventy-four. So yeah, that's a lot of units. Yeah. A lot of units. Yeah. And when you break yeah. it down, I mean, gosh, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, that 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 makes a ward number larger. But when I think about it, that, that instead of saying like you know the typical ward has, uh, well, at least in I guess typical in North America. You might have four to five hundred people on the on the rolls, maybe maybe more than that somewhere like like Utah, mm-hmm. and then a certain percentage of them are active. But what you're talking about here, I mean, 140 or whatever you said, that's like 174. Seven divided by one. So, I mean, that is 607 Tongans per ward. Period. Not just like church members. Like yeah. that's um that, that's that's dense. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of. You're right. You're right. That's crazy. There's a so, lot of. But some of those are probably small branches with a couple dozen members. But still, uh, what part of what that means is that the church really is a huge part of the infrastructure. It's like Utah in a way, uh, where there there gets to be a bit of a blurry and sometimes controversial line between government and church because of the the interrelationships there. Uh, but do you think that's going on in Tonga? Is it? I bet it is. Yeah, it's like the Utah. Yeah, State I bet the church and the just... government. I bet they. I bet they talk all the time and they coordinate activities and they share burdens and they, et cetera, et cetera. Wasn't it? And, uh, wasn't it? Ta- I should know this because of the years of doing this this show. Wasn't it many years ago? Wasn't it a prince from Tonga who was getting baptized and his family was like disowning him about it? Oh, I don't remember that. Wasn't that a thing? Ah, oh, now I got to look it up. Vamp. Now it sounds like a great Disney movie. <laughs> The, the prince's baptism. That's what it would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Tongan prince was baptized despite his father's protest. So Majesty King Tuopu, the sixth, second son, Prince Atta, was baptized as a member of the church. 
Uh, this is this crazy thing where I think Prince Otto was like stateside and they'd sent handlers like to the US to go get him and grab him. It was the whole thing. This happened around 2015. Wow. All right. Okay. We have to talk about this. This might be my favorite story of the week, and I love that I spend my time actually doing my due diligence on it. So there's a new documentary out there, everybody. The documentary is called Who Killed Joseph Smith? You might be saying to yourself, I thought we knew that. It was a mob that no one got convicted of doing, right? Right? Wrong, says a man <laughs> named, named Justin. Uh, what's his name here? I forgot. Justin. Uh, is it Griffin? Uh, Justin, Gri- Justin Griffin. A a who describes himself as a Carthage Carthage researcher, and I think this is a very clear label because if you call yourself a Carthage historian, you would have people like we'll get to it, Jana Reese, PhD types coming at you hard for daring that you are following proper research methodology uh, and proper academic rigor in your work. Now, so you're just a researcher. That's like me. Like I'm I'm a did you know I'm a Chester A. Arthur researcher, Devin? Because I read a Wikipedia entry about him once. It was very interesting. And so I and like-minded Chester A. Arthur researchers yeah. get together and posit what is really true about Chester A. Arthur. Were the were, were the, the the large sideburns real? Were the mut, mut, the mutton chops real? Who knows? Yeah. So uh, so this this is the gen, generous. It's just anyway. the same philosophy, right? The same research quality, right? It's do your own research about whether or not uh, vaccines are safe, whether the world is flat, right? It's the do your own research. And, and uh, uh, I, I hate uh, to do this, right. but I, I looked up Mr. Um, I looked up Mr. Perfect. Justin on the book face. And other than his passion project, which is this, he posts many things that are also of the ilk of, I have done my own research, and this pertains to things such as, oh, public health crises, um, public schooling, uh, various things like that. So I don't feel like that's totally fair because I'm essentially painting him with his other activities as, well, as, a, as a dubious actor involving this one. So we can, but we can judge this strictly on its own merits. And I think that's going to be fine. Yeah. So, uh, Jana Reese wrote an article about it where she just ripped it to shreds. I almost thought she was too mean in a way because after watching it and reading her stuff, I was like, she's just kind of getting on it for like faux pas and little slips of the tongue and random stuff that doesn't matter as much. I'll stand by that, but I won't stand by the documentary, which was at least interesting, I thought. I mean, it was yeah, amateur. It was... It, it was amateur hour in terms of how it was made, but oh, it yeah. was... But you had a better way to describe it, Darren. What did, how, did, how did you describe this this beautiful documentary? I, I don't remember how I described it, but it's it's oh, a, a I load of crap, words. I think. Yeah. Yeah, what did I say? But, <laughs> you said, yeah, you said it was pure crap. It was yeah. just pure. So yeah, the, the gist of it, I want to hear, I know Devin knows a lot of things about the, this church history and stuff, and I try to know things. But the, the argument, so he spends like two thirds of the documentary going over one ballistics, which is important. Okay, the, the the story behind the ballistics is basically like the narrative we've had as a church doesn't gel with the actual wounds upon those who were injured and why it would have happened this way. I think that's worth that's that merits research. That's fine. Um, so he spends a lot of time on that, a whole lot of time, then a lot of time investigating other people's popular theories and what works and what doesn't, and then he finally presents us with his own theory, and his own theory is that. Willard Richards and John Taylor killed Hiram and Joseph. That is his plan, um, based on the, the 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 entry and exit wounds on Hiram, for example. Some of which, again, okay to consider how that might have happened, which makes sense. Um, but that but his whole rationale is basically like the damage to their bodies doesn't work with like the random videos we've seen at church. Which I'm like, yeah, okay, it's like dramatization, so okay, whatever. Yeah, and. Um, which I know people can take as gospel and can take literally. So that's fair. Yeah. But then he's just saying, and the apostles had infighting. So clearly they just had to gun him down. And the yeah. reenactment of this final moment is like. <laughs> it's chaos. It's chaos. I love that they've got squibs all over the place. Basically this scene that they shot would actually make this documentary rated R if it went through the MPAA for gore, even though it's. Like it's like birdemic levels of cheaply done, but it would be just consider that that part's kind of funny. Yeah. So yeah. um, that's that's what he believes. That's what he believes. Yeah. Devin, tell me about your feelings. 
Well, it's just it's just sheer sheer poppycock. You know, it's interesting. He he sort of he does like you say. It's it's for for being an amateur effort. It's remarkably good in a way. In that uh, he's a compelling storyteller, uh, and you know. Well, I won't give him that far. I was watching it the whole time, being like, "Dude, hire an editor. Dude, hire an editor." Dude, <laughs> yeah, there is that. Yeah, <laughs> I admit, my wife and I both fell asleep during parts, but it's. Uh, it was it was pretty, but you know, he kind of starts off by agreeing with the church's uh, kind of amended narratives around the the story and trying to understand uh, exactly what the, happened. And the then story he has starts evolved to veer, years, yeah, yeah, and he starts to, you know, anyway. Um, There's some examples that I just, like way just deep so into f- it, way deep into it. He shows he offers up some painting that I think is a, that, that shows. Um, two sides of the door, basically like the mob on yeah. one side and the others on it's there. Beautiful and the, painting. It's a beautiful painting. And the mob, the, the painting seems to depict the classic story of like Hiram's right in front of the door and gets shot in the face, that kind of thing. This is a painting by a, a, a private citizen that people might, and might like, and is a beautiful painting. And somehow he like jumps to say like, this is clearly the doctrine of the church. Like why? And it's like, well, <laughs> And it, and it does. He's backpedaling from what he says before because he he recognizes yeah. that we've evolved a little bit in what we present. Like we don't we, we if he references saints as sort of being the definitive story of it, and it seems that that we can get behind a lot of uh, the saints. For example, uh, I guess a lot of people now don't believe in the whole um, John Taylor watch uh, bit of history that his watch yeah. was shot. He, he uses footage of him taking like a twenty two and shooting a pocket watch, saying, yeah. "You see, you see." Um, uh, anyway, it's, um, I spent time watching this. I spent hours of my life watching this dev. Yeah. I did this for all of you listeners. I actually will link to it or embed it or something, but I don't know. Watch it and tell yeah, me what you think, especially those of you very well versed in church history. I would enjoy seeing that. Yeah, it, it it's, um, I, I think it's important for people who watch it though, to just recognize that. Uh, it's poorly documented, and it's like so many conspiracy theory kinds of of movies. There is a pretense of research and a pretense of authority, uh, and a pretense of research, and yet it um, th- th- there are no authoritative things. And his his story in the, in the end, uh, he leaps a thousand miles from all the evidence he he creates. You know, he he creates evidence and consensus around a couple of facts that that vary from the uh, John Taylor and Willard Richards uh, versions of the story from the 1840s and 1850s, and then he just he 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 leaps like I say a thousand miles into this pure conjecture. Uh, and, and so you just have to remember as you're watching this, this guy has no credibility, right? Yes. Uh, th- there is no reason on earth to believe anything he says. Uh, if you find it a uh, curiosity to watch, go ahead and watch, but just, just remember that this is, this is poppycock. This is absolute yeah. sheer poppycock. I, I do love um, Jana, Re- Jana Reese is like, as I wrote this, I wondered if I was being too harsh. So I went to the, the Facebook page for the documentary and the first thing she finds is someone just point that says, a friend pointed out a very interesting detail. I've long wondered why on a hot summer afternoon with no air conditioning in the jail, because you know, you know, yeah. 1800s, why on earth would Willard keep his heavy overcoat on? Everyone else took their coats off except Willard. My friend said, that's how Willard was hiding his guns. Whoa. I mean, when your friend says something, yeah. you have to believe it. It's like, you know, it's the same reason you can trust Wikipedia because anyone can edit it. You got the best information because your friend yeah. believes it. Actually, Wikipedia is more reliable than this because people oh, yeah. are it's vigilantly people edited. People scrutin- scrutinize it a little bit. But yeah, one of the things that I did after uh, watching the videos, I, I realized that I knew very, very little about Willard Richards uh, because he never became a prophet uh, and he wasn't martyred. Uh, his his remarkable survival story in that uh, moment is kind of all I knew about him. It turns out he's a doctor uh, and he came out to Utah. Uh, he was called by Brigham Young to be his second counselor in the first presidency uh, and died at 49. 
Uh, he oh, was well. a fairly young guy. He was yeah. Joseph Smith's age, about, uh, uh, and uh, died still in his forties uh, in Utah after moving there. So, but uh, he organized as a, as a doctor. He organized uh, kind of an army of midwives in Utah, and so he he was responsible for making sure that. Utah's, you know, infant mortality and maternal mortality was, uh, you know, as good as you could get under the circumstances of the frontier life back in the mid 1850s. Uh, remarkable guy. That's interesting. Uh, and I, th- you know, that kind of passion for women's issues uh, at that time really struck me as as noble. And it's a shame in a way that we don't know more of Willard Richard's story, but I was glad to be prompted to look him up because he's a See, really cool it did, guy. It, it gave you a good thing then. You found yeah, something yeah. positive out of it. Yeah. Um, oh, I just had a, one last thought about the doc. Oh, the, so the interesting thing is at the very end of the doc- documentary, we learn that our, our host, uh, this Justin fella, uh, was apparently excommunicated. They don't use that word, but they say after doing this, he, and and despite being like a faithful member and believing it, his records, you know, he was denied his entry, his membership in the church yeah. after local leaders or leadership. He just says LDS leaders asked him not to go public with his findings. Finding is a curious word. Um, assertions <laughs> yeah. might be a better yeah. noun, but um, that's actually really interesting to me. I, I mean, I'm assuming it implies that someone caught wind of what he was doing, and I'm assuming it's the allegation that two senior church leaders were actually murderers, and that's the kind of thing that falls along the. Yeah. I don't know if that you know that's the kind of the same thing if you're going out in public and if if you were waving a sign saying something along similar lines about President Nelson, your stake president might have some words to want to share with you. Yeah, yeah and, uh, exactly. Yeah, so. Um, and to say nothing of the fact that President Nelson's living, which would make it even worse because then it would become an actual yeah. case. So I don't know. Interesting to watch. Interesting to get an idea about people who have ideas. Uh, I'll also note that his Facebook page has one image he shares that shows North America and like colored dots of uh, Native American settlements. And it basically just says something like, why did if, if the Native Americans came over on a land bridge across the Bering Strait, why are the majority of the settlements on the east coast of the United States? We're going full heartland here, baby. <laughs> it's a fair point. Why didn't they all settle in the Yukon? It's lovely up there. Yeah. Come on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, poppycock. Let's end up. <laughs> um, uh, but Malarkey. a better documentary, better documentary, got a little attention at Sundance this week. Sundance, of course, is virtual. It was canceled because of Omicron as a, an in-person event and tickets were not refunded and people were angry. But uh, the, the screenings went on uh, virtually. And one of them was a documentary called The Mission that follows four missionaries, all of them from Utah, on their missions in Finland, which is rather hostile to the church. And so I thought it was great Finland, to see that. You think Finland is hostile to the church? Uh, hostile-ish. Yeah, that's what Host- one of the things that it says. Word. Really? Hostile? Interesting. I mean, well, like Russia, unwelcoming. Uh, yes. Yeah. You know, but yeah, Finland is as close to Russia as you can get without being in Russia. Uh Culturally, is that a metric otherwise. we can use? Because, I mean, you could say that yeah. same thing about Estonia, Latvia, Lith- uh, you know, Belarus, yeah. Ukraine, they're, Georgia. They're probably in competition. Yeah, Azerbaijan. I guess. Yeah. Poland. Yeah. yeah. Have you China. ever been to Finland? I have not been to Finland. Yeah, I, apparently, and apparently now they're very hard. <laughs> I don't want to go there. It's a Latter-day Saint, <laughs> yeah. apparently. That's no, what. I want to go. Uh Remember that I, nice story but, they gave us during conference about the temple from Elder Renlin, the temple in yeah. Finland, the Finnish members were like, oh, this is dynamite. Let the Russians do it first. We're cool. We're cool like that. Yeah. yeah. Hostile. Interesting word to use. Hostile. Yeah. But that's kind of the sense. thesis of the movie is that uh, this is a challenging place to be a missionary. Well, challenging, I don't receptive. doubt. I mean, most of Europe is a challenging place to be a missionary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where there's just not a lot of, I mean, Finland has a temple. It doesn't have a ton of members, but it has a temple and uh, a lot of good members. What I love in the story yeah. from the Tribune is sort of the story of how they got this done. Cause the filmmaker was not a member of the church, I believe. And they had to get permission and they actually got the president in Finland forwarded the filmmaker's request up the chain to Salt Lake city. 
And Anderson, the filmmaker, credits one person in the church's communications office who's now a reporter at a Salt Lake City TV station for helping overcome bureaucratic obstacles. And at the time, the missionary department's executive director was Elder Brent H. Nielsen, who spoke in the most recent general conference. Um, and he served as mission in Finland. So you could say it's coincidence, or you could also say there might be some divine providence in a lot of the right people being in line in the right times in order to get this done and be able to allow a filmmaker to follow missionaries around for a production that is not controlled by the church. That's the big thing. I'm sure, yeah. you know, we're more than, if you remember that in visitor center is that thing, what they, did they call it? Wasn't it also called the mission? You know, when they'd show all the different missionaries in San Diego at temple at the visitor. Oh, center I don't know what that was called. Yeah. I forgot what the name of it was, but like, that was great too. That was also produced by the church. So it had a very clear angle to it. I, yeah, I'd love yeah. to see this if I can, whenever I get a chance. Yeah. I can't wait to see this one too. Yeah. It'll be very interesting. It'll be very interesting. And then we, we will be able to see for our own selves how hostile Finland is to missionaries, <laughs> so, if at all, if at all. So speaking of how hostile Europe is and uh, to, towards missionaries and one who, as one who served a mission in Europe, I can, which I proudly say to everyone, uh, the President Nelson did a, a little little fireside. Little little gathering, special special meeting for the Europe area. A devotional is actually the word I'm looking to use. Over the weekend, January 23rd, and President Nelson, Elder Bednar were there. They spoke to the saints in Europe. You know, these are all great. Obviously, these things are remote. I think there would have been a time outside of COVID when they would have traveled to Europe, and at the very oh, least, sure. they still would have been present somewhere in Europe, probably in Germany or the UK, and then broadcasted around the the continent. But um, they really want to rally the saints. And President Nelson said, you know, you might feel like religion is dying in Europe, but but the church has an unparalleled future because of its faithful members, said the church president, which I think is great. I mean, it is not, it is not easy to serve a mission in Europe. Yeah. Uh, he, he talked about the five years that he served uh, as responsible for the affairs of the church in Europe. And that assignment even took him to nations of Eastern Europe that were, that were then closed yeah. to the church. So he Back made, in the 80s. Yeah, he made 26 trips to Europe. He said, I love this quote. He's like, I walked your streets, sometimes pulling my suitcase through deep snow, met with many government officials, most of whom, of whom were not initially welcoming, and had my soul lifted by your magnificent art, music, and culture. During those five intense years, the countries of Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Ukraine, and what was then Yugoslavia were miraculously open to the preaching of the gospel. And then approval from Russia followed in 1991 because, of course, the Soviet Union fell apart because communism's a failure. So, um, yeah. Good times for this. I, I told Devin, I kind of laughed just using the line unparalleled future. I'm like, that could mean a lot of things. That could, <laughs> yeah. that could mean the church is going to grow everywhere else and they will be unparalleled to you where it is stagnant, yeah. uh, which I certainly hope is not the case, but it's 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 good to, to pump up the saints here. Yeah. In your Most opinion. of the messages, I re-read the recap. I didn't yeah. hear, I didn't watch this, the, the, the speech, but the, that is, your, I read the recap. A lot of the message seemed to be focused on helping the saints there buck up. A little yeah. It bit. seems like, like not despair almost in a way. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I've really developed this, this view of, of the future. You know, we, we, we love the, the prophecy of Daniel that the church will, you know, roll forth like the stone cut without hands and all that right. stuff. And, and, and in so many ways that has happened. Right. And, and I, I think a lot of us uh, expect that momentum to continue. And yet, uh, there are also scriptures that talk about the saints as like salt or leaven. And you think about how little a yeast goes in bread or how much, how little salt goes in a meal compared to the weight of the meal. And you realize uh, we scatter a few saints around the world and, and we can accomplish the mission. Uh, our, we don't need to convert everyone in so many ways. Uh, and quite literally, our temples are for that. Uh, for those we don't reach. But uh, in terms of bringing the world together, unifying, uh, maybe we don't need to have uh, a Tonga level penetration or a Utah uh, level penetration of the gospel in every community in the world. It, it may be very European. Uh, maybe that's why um, maybe that's why they've announced they've they've surprisingly announced, more temples in Europe over the past few years? Are we just kind of saying like, this is going to happen when they're, everyone's dead. So we just need to get the temples built. <laughs> <Yeah>. so <they laughs> can, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> so they, they can do it. The one thing to bear in mind, and President Mel Nelson noted this, Europe's, uh, the church there, yeah, it's, it's, it exists. It's okay. Like you've got members there and everything. 
But at the same time, the church as it exists today globally would not exist without the European converts of the 19th century and without their faith and sacrifices, without them coming over and crossing the plains and going and settling with the saints in Missouri and, of course, later in Utah. Like, had that not happened, it's strictly conjecture, but I don't know how well the church could have survived yeah. without the European migrants. And, like, to, I don't know, I'm getting like emotional, but like, we owe the European saints a humongous debt of gratitude for their history. And there are those who's, yeah. You know, we don't know everyone's lineage, like if some ever went back or if like most of the members in Europe have histories that are in their family lines, if they're multi-generational in the church, if they are from after the pioneer era, because all the ones before that, for the most part, left. Obviously, not all of them did. Um, but seriously, like we owe a lot of the stability of the church in our day and age to Europe. And in many ways, that sacrifice is real because the church is strong and flourishing in many places around the world, even while by by a lot of weight, by a lot of measures, it struggles in Europe, even though they've given us a lot <laughs> to keep everything going globally. So just like consider that when you realize like there's the church is gangbusters somewhere like Africa. Ironically enough, would that even be possible without Europe, which is just a weird thing to say because of colonialism and whatever. But you know what I mean? You get yeah. That. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, and it, it's a great reminder, Jeff, your little comment there about colonialism, uh, that these things are complicated. Oh, big They're complicated. Uh, and, uh, you know, we it we we love to simplify things in the church uh, because it makes the the the, the retelling in uh, primary easier. <laughs> but uh, yeah. you know, the, the reality is complicated. Uh, it, one of the sad realities in Europe right now is that uh, there is an imminent threat of war in Ukraine. It's very scary. Um, I know you have uh, deep thoughts about this, but uh, one of the things that's gone on, of course, uh, Jeff, is that the church has pulled missionaries out of Ukraine right now. I hope it's temporary. I hope they'll be back soon. Yeah. Uh, my gosh, we, we should all be praying, uh, as the church has asked, for peace uh, in Ukraine because it's really a scary time right now. Yeah. Dude, I'm like going to cry right now. Um... I'm sorry. It breaks my heart. I've spent time with the Ukrainian people and uh, I've seen the incredible faith of the membership in Ukraine, which was one of the, I remember one of the first things I noted in my journal, like after being there for a couple of, a week, a week or two or something like that. And I just said like, there's something different, like the Lord is somehow prepared this country differently than elsewhere. And I know that they were pumped up like they, sure, they had the first stake in the whole entire former Eastern Bloc to say nothing of just the Soviet, former Soviet Union. But the faith I saw from the members there uh, and their attitude was just remarkable. And that doesn't make them better than anybody else, obviously, or anything like that. But it just something felt different. And you could tell the church was invested in Ukraine, really. Like the, the work was going well there. We have a, a temple there, the first temple built way out in Eastern Europe and the first temple in the, in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. Um, even the buildings they had there, like nicer, newer buildings, like the church is investing in physical infrastructure in Ukraine. When I served my mission in Spain and the church had been there for 40 years and I didn't see that, that level of investment, you know, um, and mm -hmm. there's something to be said for when it's just newer, when it's a newer time that you've been in a country and you know, everything's newer. I get that. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I sorry, I just, no, I just, I, 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 I marveled at them and, um, just the people there at large. You have a people in Ukraine who have twice had a democratic revolution just because they want a better, freer life. And they've never even said they don't want to have a relationship with Russia. They just don't want Russia to control them. And now they're on the brink of Moscow deciding that we don't care. You are our vassal. End of story. Yeah. Uh, and that just sucks. And we don't have to have a whole foreign policy discussion right now. Um, and you know, I've done a lot, I did a lot of undergrad, graduate, and even professional work on Ukraine. So this is something that uh, is dear to me, but I cut you off there a second ago. Devin, no, I was just going to say, you know, as you alluded, you know, this is really a complicated place because it's the, uh, it is the primary buffer between NATO and uh, Russia. And Russia likes to view it as uh, being on its side and over the last couple of decades, Ukraine has moved more in the direction of NATO and kind of wanting to be a member of NATO. 
Uh, and yet there are residents, there are Ukrainians who want to be part of Russia or more aligned with Russia. Yeah. This is not simple and easy. And uh, it, it just breaks my heart to think about people shooting each other over this this issue. Not that there's an easier way to solve it, but... Uh, well, and they've been doing it for a long time. I mean, that's the thing everyone's talking right now about, like a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia's been invading Ukraine for eight years, ever since they took over Crimea and right. had their little their proxy war going on in the Donbass and in the eastern areas of Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, And so that's, that's the reality of it, but it's just like, ugh, it's just so, it's sad because the, the ironic thing here is even when I was in there, we did some public opinion work and this was back in 2006, but even since then, while people, while Ukrainians largely wanted your better European integration, eventual European union membership, they see this as a good thing. And there's a lot of work to do to get there. Ukraine is incredibly corrupt. Uh, NATO membership was not a big thing that people wanted. And it wasn't even a big thing people wanted even going into 20, late 2013, early 2014. But ever since uh, Russia decided to send the little green men into Crimea and start what's been going on now for the past eight years, shocking news, the Ukrainian people now want to join NATO by significant majorities <laughs> now want to join NATO. So it's it's just another yeah. thing that reminds me that as long, this whole time Putin has been making hey about like well no this is about like i don't want ukraine in nato i don't want nato on my doorstep that he's very sensitive about it because the baltic three baltic states joined nato back a number of years ago and they were part yeah. of the soviet union finland's not part of nato finland is not aligned um and poland's in nato and all that so of course like they can't be in nato and like you know we have to protect our interests but it's like dude they didn't want to join nato before you did this in the first place like people need to remember that yeah. NATO membership was not a main priority, but now, of course, it's a country that feels extremely vulnerable and wants the security that comes from NATO, especially because the West is largely um, um, waffled on honoring the Budapest Memorandum, which was the thing back when the Soviet Union ended. When the Soviet Union fell apart, um, Ukraine, as a successor state, found itself with a stockpile of nuclear weapons. Uh, Ukraine was always kind of the number two in the Soviet Union in terms of importance after Russia. But Ukraine instead said, we won't keep our nukes if we can get aid from the West and you can give us securities that will like have our our integrity as a country and our border integrity. And so Russia signed it. Western nations signed it. Like, OK, that's a fair deal. You give up your nukes and we're going to you, you'll leave the nuclear club in exchange for security. And then Putin just hasn't cared. And he's as much as said, like, that doesn't that was 25 years ago. Who cares? Like, that doesn't matter yeah. anymore. Anyway, sorry, everybody. Um, all missionaries are leaving Ukraine. And like you said, hopefully they'll be back sometime soon. Uh, I hope Weird this resolves peacefully and quickly. And weirdly, a statement from the the spokesperson said, because now Ukraine used to have four missions, now there's only two, but he called it the, the ones in the Ukraine Kiev slash Moldova missions. And I was like, when did Moldova become part of a Ukrainian mission? It used to be part of Romania's mission. I believe Romania is now a combined mission with Hungary, but Moldova is more or less a linguistically, I don't want to say ethnically, but whatever. It's, it's a Romanian area that was once part of greater Romania. The, the history is complicated, but under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between the Nazis and the Soviets, uh, they let the Soviets take part of what that part of Romania was, and that was part of the Soviet Union. And then when independence came in the early 90s, it became the independent country of Moldova, which is largely Romanian, which is why it was part of the Romania mission. I have no idea why it's part of the Kiev mission, but okay, whatever. <laughs> I, don't I don't know what that's all about. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let's do some good news here. Let's do. Okay. Some good. good. Yeah. Oh, let's do that. Oh, sorry. I, uh, uh, so the giving machines, they're done, right? Um, for the year, I'm assuming they'll come mm -hmm. back next, back next year. Uh, great job, Boncom folks. My hat goes off to you for having such a great idea all those years ago, and one that's really stuck. The church has announced how much money or, or resources we received in donations. So we exceeded five point eight million dollars during the 2021 Christmas season as part of the Light the World campaign. They estimate 300,000 people visited giving machines in 10 U.S. cities. Some other cool metrics here. More than 1.7 million meals and 14,000 boxes of fresh produce will feed the hungry. Nearly 20,000 children will receive essential clothing. More than 837,000 children, children will receive the polio vaccine. More than 80,000 80, chickens will provide families with long-term nutrition and income uh, potential. Now, this is not the highest one on record, by the by the way. Um, the 2019 season had 6.3 million, and 2020 it didn't happen. But I don't think 5.8 million is anything to shake a stick at, especially considering even little things like t the fact that 
the Temple Square Christmas display in general was was scaled back quite a bit this year, which I'm sure resulted in fewer people even being around just Temple Square in Utah to say nothing about the yeah. locations. So dynamite. Awesome that they did so well with this and uh, looking forward to more of it. I'm hoping they'll do it here at the end of 2022. Yeah, I, it is a great, great tradition and I hope it, it lasts forever. Um, and because it is just such a good way for us to put our best foot forward uh, because the the church does a good job with this stuff, and, yeah. And we ought to we ought to brag about it, uh, so that when people think about Mormons, I'd sure rather they think about our humanitarian efforts and not our dietary patterns uh, first. <laughs> which, you know, which I explained in detail to a Jewish colleague today who was curious about it. I'm like, that's what I <laughs> that's what I leaned on. Well, actually, actually, I don't drink the uh, coffee. Sorry to yeah. Listen. <laughs> well, we were talking yeah. about kosher, and then so it pivoted over to my 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 side of the house. Yes, the dietary yes. restriction things. Yeah. Yes, at least our Jewish friends uh, can empathize a little bit better uh, uh, than a lot of our other friends. But uh, uh, speaking of uh, interreligion, uh, ecumenical thoughts, uh, the church published this week a brilliant, and I'm excited about this. Uh, new pamphlet uh, called, uh, what is it called? Muslims and Latter-day Saints, Beliefs, Values, and Lifestyles. Uh, And it's intended to be a very respectful, friendly treatise on uh, Muslim doctrine. And so all of us should really dig into this. It's 35 pages. That's very readable for most of us, but, you know, block out an hour and read this and, and, make sure that we better understand our Muslim friends and can treat them with more respect. Uh, I suspect my personal read on this is that part of this reflects a desire by the church to end some of the anti-Muslim beliefs that have crept into Mormon culture uh, in the last decade or two. And I'm thrilled to see that. Uh, I know I've had some lots of Mormon friends over the years say very, very mean uh, and intolerant things about uh, Muslims. And I'm just thrilled to see the church stepping into that uh, and squaring off with us on that to get us on the right frame of mind. I think it's very important. And this this little product is awesome. It talks about the various things we share with them, you know, how we can understand Islam better, how it relates to us. It's terrific. And of course, Elder Bednar is involved in a lot of this. And you'd have to be sleeping under a rock not to have noticed how much Elder Bednar has been interfacing with uh, members of the Islamic community and Islamic leadership and also even traveling to the Middle East. And I mean, he's the first apostle to go to like Sudan, for example. Uh, that's That's cool stuff. And we're doing, like you said, I think we're doing this deliberately both for our own ranks, hopefully for the ranks of the world at large, because by and large, yeah, Muslims are good people who have good faith traditions and also love their families and want good lives. And yeah, there are radicals among them, but newsflash folks, there are radicals amongst Christians as well. Go figure, yeah, right? And, and even more ones. Yes, yeah. absolutely. There are. I'm, I'm excited yeah. for that. Uh, including the uh, Captain Moroni at the insurrection last year. <laughs> and he's not, he's not the worst offender. He was just kind of, <laughs> he just kind of seemed like a guy who, yeah, anyway, we don't have to get no. into that. Um, back to BYU though, a bit of interesting intrigue that came out last week. So the U S department of education has launched an investigation into BYU over how it disciplines LGBTQ students and whether or not it disciplines them, disciplines them unfairly compared to others, others like non LGBTQ students and whether that is a violation of their civil rights under Title IX. So that's the gist of it. Obviously, this is a big deal because you actually have the federal government investigating BYU. As a reminder, BYU is a, is a private school, so it can set a lot of its standards. And when it comes to that, Title IX has many exemptions for that, for private institutions uh, that allows them to more or less do what they want. Um, there is kind of a quote from Kerry Jenkins, who's the spokesperson for BYU, that it practically reads... I mean, I know I'm interpreting this myself, but it practically reads about basically saying like, look, we're discriminating as much as we are legally allowed to do so under Title IX. That's almost what the wording says if you pick it apart. Yeah. 
uh, I, think which the, is, I, I think the federal government has generally been pretty generous with BYU and other schools. Yeah. BYU is the first to get an exemption under Title IX and other universities, uh, you know, I presume like Liberty University and Oral Roberts have been getting the same kinds of exemptions that BYU gets. Yeah. So this is a thing that's happening right now. And we have to, and we're reminded that, you know, BYU can set a lot of these standards and um, that's, that's, it's private property doing its thing. It's just interesting. This is happening in the wake of last week when we talked about BYU updating its, uh, its protest policy as a response to last year's light the why uh, yeah. incident that happened. So we'll see what comes of this. I've seen some wondering whether this can be BYU could potentially lose accreditation. I mean, it could, but losing accreditation is a very complex kind of labyrinthine process that isn't just going to happen like on a whim just because no. the Department of Education takes issue with Title IX violations. It doesn't just happen like that. But, no, I, so, you're, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah little risk of that, even though there's been a lot of questions about that. I I think the, the likely outcome here, if I'm predicting, uh, I'm going to predict that the likely outcome will be a, uh, a fairly amicable uh, settlement and adjustment and that, that will include BYU announcing some modest changes to its uh, uh, honor code and it's the administration of the honor code. It, but I don't expect it'll be anything dramatic. Um, but I, I think that that's what will happen is that the church will work with uh, the Department of Education or the Department of Justice or whatever and, and work this out and and but then uh, um, but make some make some additional accommodations to make everybody happy. But then there'll be the bigger scandal when you find out that Lavelle Edwards didn't die of his own accord. He was murdered <laughs> by Kevin Worthen. <laughs> right. Yes. The, the uh, just in case new lawyers are listening, that, 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 was, that was satire. Just want to be clear about this, everybody. Just yeah. want to be very clear. If any ecclesiastical or legal authorities are listening to me right now, I am <laughs> yeah. not actually alleging that. Yeah, but uh, a little more fun going out at BYU is um, one of the letters to the editor this week at the Daily Universe was making a compelling case for allowing BYU students, men, to grow long hair. Uh, and, uh, you know, having, I think we've talked a little bit about the beard thing at BYU, you and I, because my friend Warner Woodworth is uh, leading the charge on beards at BYU. Uh, this That's goes a just right cause. hand in hand. Yeah. So <laughs> it is It is an interesting one to see uh, and uh, hard to take it too seriously, but uh, I hope, I can't, you know, I'm, a, I'm in favor of uh, more flexibility. Uh, and it's, it's the classic case too. It's like, Banning long hair was a reaction to hippies. That's not a thing anymore. So why do we care about long hair? But what I love, what I love is the image that I'm assuming he submitted yeah. in this yeah, opera, right. in this universe contributor that Dane, Dane Keckley from Highland, Utah submitted. And he said, here's, here's the feature image I want you to use if you accept my reader's forum submission. It's a picture of celebrity Jason Momoa, Aquaman himself, as an example of a guy with well-kept long hair. Um, yeah. And uh, because his hair is, I yeah. guess that's well-kept long hair. It actually looks a little wild and fun to me to say nothing yeah. of what no one would describe as a well-groomed beard, nor modest attire. I believe he's shirtless underneath that blazer <laughs> he's sport, wearing. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting choice to use. The other funny thing is it's from Google Images. I sure as heck hope he actually checked to see if it was one that did not have copyright. Because just because you found something on Google doesn't mean that's it's right. your free image to use. Yeah, uh, I'm more passionate about allowing well-groomed beards at BYU than long hair because man buns are stupid, and that's, <laughs> and that's just how. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, that's just how it is. Yeah. Uh, real quick follow-up: last week, I'm, a lot of reference to last week's show. This week, but last week uh, we spoke a little bit about President Nelson being four years in his church president, and some of the things we'd seen, some of our favorite changes, maybe some of our least favorite. I had to. I stepped all over myself trying to think of my least favorite. But Jana Reese wrote actually a very pol positive article about the, the top 10 ones that she noticed. I just thought it was nice to kind of remember some that maybe we didn't bring up on the show. I'll just read them off real quick. Number one was reversing the 2015 LGBT exclusion policy, uh, giving women a more active role in ritual life, including in the temple, moving toward more diverse international leadership, 
making improvements to the missionary program. Uh, what she basically means is like how President Nelson has de-emphasized kind of the tough it out approach to missionary life. You know, like now they can call home more often. Uh, you can do shorter service missions. It seems like we're trying not to turn those who return home early for missions into like social pariahs. Like we're trying to do a little bit better on that front. And even also not everyone has to wear white shirts or ties. Lots of changes have happened. Yeah. Um, trying to balance out the youth program by getting rid of Boy Scouts and equaling it with women to our church. She thinks they've adapted pretty skillfully to the global pandemic. I'm inclined to agree. I think we were a little slow on the uptake, but now we're doing better. Um, Bishop's interviews have changed a little bit. We can allow we have, we've changed the the questions to be asked. We've allowed parents to be present, all sorts of things like that. Um, replacing home teaching with ministering and ending the Hilkamora pageant, which she th- thinks is a relic of a basically a goofier, more problematic time. And it's better to move on and let it just remain a part of our history. So fun follow-up. We'll link to it. She has explanations for all of them in detail if you are so interested. Yeah. That was kind of an interesting piece that she wrote. Uh, uh, Fun to think about. Uh, I'm sure everyone has their own top 10 uh, or at least their top top picks of the things that have happened since uh, President Nelson was called. But it's, it's interesting. I think most of us would probably agree that he has made bigger changes than we anticipated. I I bet there's a clear consensus around that. And that was one of the points I think she made in that uh, article, which was was pretty good. I agree. I think it was also under President Nelson that uh, we could start getting reimbursed for church expenses um, direct to our bank accounts. No more checks. Oh, yeah, yeah. That one flew under the radar, folks. But who wants to get a physical check cut from your ward clerk when you can just be direct deposit? Come on. It is so nice to be able to do that now. Uh, That is a great point. And that was really nice to get that done during COVID when some of us didn't want to go to church uh, when we're attending virtually. So that's cool. Um, Let me just mention as we get close to wrapping up here that uh, Roots Tech is coming up March 3rd through 5th. It will be all virtual this year. You know, it's a huge conference that is done on uh, family history that the church organizes every year, uh, and it will be virtual this time. Uh, Elder Suarez and his wife uh, will be among the keynote speakers, and that was announced this week, but that's March 3rd through 5th. It's free and virtual so we can all go that's cool uh, and it'll be cool to good. you know get the agenda and pick out some sessions even if you don't want to go to the whole thing you know I, virtual conferences i just think are great think about this instead of having to go to utah from you know whether that's california or florida or wherever else now you just dial in and you can pick up two sessions and be really blessed by that instead of deciding how oh, you can't afford to go to utah for a week for uh, for the conference, so really great. I'm excited. Now, now, Devin, um, you seem to be passing on the final story. Are you trying to skip this deliberately? <laughs> well, there was that little bit uh, about uh, our pro COVID uh, house uh, or uh, legislature in Utah. Oh, like, that's uh, the best label I've ever heard. Our pro COVID legislature. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's just it's just crazy, uh, but. You know, the the state obviously delegates some authority to um, health departments in the state of Utah. Uh, But last year, they created a law that uh, allows the legislature without without and this is important, without the confirmation of the government of the governor, excuse me, to repeal or revoke a health department action. And so this uh, really unusually right-wing legislature, far righter wing than Utah's populace, let's be clear, it is not representing the mainstream of Utah. It is representing the right wing of Utah, Uh, horribly gerrymandered districts, grossly misrepresentative, but... uh, they, they, the, the Republican-led legislature showed up ready f- for COVID. So they, so the Senate president uh, told people he was uh, not didn't have COVID despite having tested positive twice. Twice he tested positive. Uh, he obviously did have COVID. Showed up, uh, shook hands with Elder Gong, um, and. 
Uh, and of course, no one was wearing masks uh, among the Republicans. Uh, it was it was a pro COVID celebration. Uh, the first week of the Utah legislative session last week. So uh, absolute mayhem. That's that's my take on that. Uh, I did skip it because I didn't want to say that, but you you forced me. I had I no choice. You. I didn't my, mean to, Devin. I, my, I was in, you you went off. I was merely just going to say, hey. So the president, Stuart Adams, who's a member of the church, uh, yeah. even though he tried to backtrack, tested positive, and then he's shaking Elder Gong's hand when he's got COVID. Who's and Elder yeah. Gong's had COVID back in the early early days, back in the early times. Yeah. I wasn't going to say as much as you did, Devin. I was just going to cover it, you know, factually, yeah. the news being That's used. right. But now but, you got my take. You but now my, Devin has declared Utah yeah. with having a pro-COVID legislature. So that yeah, is go. our positive note to end on, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to listen to This Week in Mormons. You can find us at thisweekinmormons.com. Every single, uh, all the articles we mentioned here are linked with the uh, the relative, the post for this episode. And uh, please join us on social media as well. And big shout out to our patrons on Patreon, patreon.com slash This Week in Mormons. You people keep this show running. You keep it financially feasible for us to continue making this program. And for that, we thank you immensely. Um, if you want to join the fun on that, you know, chip in four bucks a month, please go to patreon.com slash This Week in Mormons and join the fray. That'd be super, super awesome of you. Um, but thanks to all of you for listening. Seriously, we uh, can't do it without you. Much appreciated. Devin, thank you for your fine time, sir. And I hope you continue thank to you. enjoy your time down there in the Sunshine State, DeSantis country. Heck yes. Um, <laughs> the Freedom Peninsula. Hey, I've joined your ranks now. I've got a Republican governor now, too. Woo! Party time. Living the dream. As of last <laughs> week, we're partying hard. Congratulations. Up here, thank you. Thank you kindly. It's <laughs> always fun to have a little bit of pluralism everywhere we go, right? Whether that's church that's right. or in life. That's our takeaway. Right. So uh, thanks for listening, folks. Have a great week. This has been uh, This Week in Mormons. That's Devin. I'm Jeff. Take care. See you later.